With us, we have a, a panel of experts on uh, mid-journey and discord, uh, as much as anyone can be experts in this rapidly evolving field. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the experiment that we did at the Bridge Conference about generative AI, some tips on how you can use this for your headshot or for your everyday marketing life. So Danielle Ferguson from Production Solutions, would you like to take it away? Sure. Welcome, everybody. Um, we're just going to start off talking a little bit, like Nick said, about what we did. Um, so we'll move down to the next slide and talk a little bit about what gener generative AI is. And that is, it refers to a type of artificial intelligence that can create new and original content, such as music or images or text. Um, with, and it uses a creative machine that can produce its own unique um, content. So we're just going to show you a little bit how we did this um, and what we did at Bridge 2023 um, a few weeks ago. So we went, we had at our booth, we took headshots and during the conference, people would come up to the booth, we'd take their headshot and then we'd also give them the option at the booth to have some AI flair added to their headshot. Um, and at the booth, we we got the interest, you know, what what their special requests were for. Um, and then they opted in yes or no if they wanted to have the AI player added to their headshot. Show you some examples. Um, if anybody watches, I believe this is Yellowstone, but um, this is uh, Jim Moore, and we took his headshot and created um uh, some flair on that. And we have a couple more examples to show you as well as some of the headshots and, and how they, uh, what was produced with AI. And superheroes was one of our most popular choices, Wonder Woman, um, Superman, but we used, creatively used prompts using Midjourney to create from the original headshot um, and tried our best to keep the images um, uh, the facial image the same, and then put the AI flare behind it. So here was one request for Wonder Woman. And then we had requests for cowboys. So we had here um, a John Wayne request to look like John Wayne. So we uh, use the AI flare to create this image. Pixar. So we have, you can do a lot of different things. You can make them realistic. You can make them cartoon looking. Um, so this one was a request for a Pixar. And then if we ask for hobbies, we had runners, we had um, swimming, biking, we had all kinds of different hobbies. This one happened to be someone who enjoyed fishing. And then we had one for world transformation. So this was a, we had creatively thought of different things and used prompts to create a world transformation um, image from the original image. All right, so now we're gonna get into using AI and how we use that to create the magic that we did from the headshots. Okay. Thank you, Jordan. Muted, sorry. First things first, there are some things that you have to do to be able to kind of get going on AI, specifically with Midjourney. Uh, Midjourney is a website that you can go to and you can get an account through them and a subscription through their service, but they use the app, uh, they, the actual use of the app takes place in another app called Discord. And Discord, once you create an account, uh, and then you can essentially set up your subscription, whether it's a trial, whether it's an actual full-on subscription. With Midjourney, they can they have an internal way to connect to, to each other, and Midjourney's website will help you to connect. Uh, they have a few plans. There's a basic plan, which gets you a very few generations a month, and you basically are paying for different levels of access to their servers. Um, and then once you connect, to Discord, you'll operate basically all completely within Discord. That'll be your home for creating all of your images. Um, and we can move on to the next one. And um, 
if you want to move to the next one. All right. So there's a few things before you get started uh, in, in the actual Discord and in MidJourney. There's a few settings that are worth it for you to tweak um, to be able to kind of have more control of what you're doing. Um, specifically, there's a mode in MidJourney called Remix Mode. And what Remix Mode allows you to do is to Every time you generate an image and you look at it and you go, okay, well, I like this image, but I need a little bit different, something different about it. It allows you to tweak that prompt from that specific image and, and re-roll and create something different and you can make tiny tweaks to it. So remix mode is within the settings and you can, and you can access that, change it and turn that on. That'll help you out a ton. And then also you can change the aspect ratio. I think it's pretty common. For us, we're doing storyboards uh, more where we're working in 16 by 9 because it's closer to what will come out on TV. A lot of these images that we did uh, for the headshots were in one-to-one, -one, um, but you can change that aspect ratio. So there's little tweaks that you can make. Um, and you can get a lot more of those specific commands on how to make those changes within MidJourney's website. They have a huge breakdown guide um, that gives you every single command you could possibly need if you have a question their website is a huge asset. And then there's also a thing called photo bashing, which we'll get into a little bit later, um, but that essentially allows us to uh, have a little bit more control over, over what MidJourney is trying to create. And then for the next one. So your first step in MidJourney is to upload, especially if you're trying to do a headshot or a photo is to upload the original photo that we have. And we took all your guys' photos that were submitted to us and we use those as reference photos. And you essentially are gonna upload to Discord, which is in the chat bot. You have to kind of click on the mid journey chat bot and talk to the chat bot. There's a little photo button or a plus button depending on the Discord you're using. Um, and you can click on that plus and upload a photo that's your reference. You can also drag that photo into Discord, either way it works. Um, and once you do that, you basically hit enter and MidJourney takes that photo and takes a reference capture of it. You then can copy the link, which is pretty easy. You just right click on the photo in Discord, copy link, and then you paste that into your prompt, which essentially allows you to have that as your reference image, which I think might be on the next slide. So once, that's, once that image is copy, copy that link, you would then type in the imagine prompt, which is basically the prompt that you're always gonna be using in Discord. It's the slash imagine, you're gonna type that in, you're gonna copy and paste uh, that media link that you have uh, from the reference image, and then you're gonna hit one space and start typing in your prompt, which is the words that you're gonna use to uh, build the world that you've created for this person. So it takes a little bit of practice, but it's pretty easy. It's just uploading those photos, copy that link, paste it into the imagine command and start typing out your prompt. Okay. So for example, on some of these, uh, we had, uh, we entered the prompts and it, what will happen is that MidJourney will generate four images. There are four varying images, depending on uh, some of your settings, they may be highly vary varied, sometimes they're pretty similar. And it allows you to have four choices. You can go, okay, which one of these do I think yeah, looks the best or matches the goal that you need to make. Uh, maybe one is more close to the reference image and you want to work with that one. But you can pick from those four photos which one you want to continue working from. Um, you can either upscale w uh, one image and, and say that's the one you want to use. Or you can click on the V, which will allow you to then use that remix mode that we've enabled earlier and make tweaks to the prompt and essentially do another re-roll and see if you can tweak that image to get a better result. Um, and we usually have to, it's, it's pretty common as we're making these image to have to do a few re-rolls before you get to the image that you're trying to, to create. Um, you can also uh, try different images. Um, there's a bunch of different uh, techniques you can put in one image that you think, okay, maybe the smile is throwing mid-journey off and you'll do an image without a smile. We had a lot of instances where we would pick the image that works best. Maybe you oppose specifically kind of works better for the style of character you're trying to create. So it's all about really just experimenting um, with different images and different uh, prompts and, and uh, choices in your variations 
And you can always go to MidJourney's website. They have so many lists on ways to maybe vary those prompts and come up with ways to have a more unique and specific to what your goals are image. Okay. Uh, at this point, we're going to kick it over to Steve Kessler to do a live demonstration of this. So I'm going to shot, stop sharing my screen. Uh, Steve, over to you. Yeah, thanks. I mean, what, what could go wrong with a live demonstration of, uh, you know, AI, right? So we're, we're going to play around with like Nick's image a little bit here and just kind of go through some of the steps that uh, Jordan uh, just talked about. Oh, man. <laughs> so, sorry, Nick, uh, about your uh, long blonde ponytail there. Uh, so and actually, if, if anybody wants to put in the chat what they would like to see, uh, what variations of Nick they might like to see, go ahead and uh, go ahead and put that in the chat. and We can uh, try that out. Um, so basically, to kind of just show you the steps that uh, uh, Jordan was talking about, first thing, you know, we just need to be able to sign, open up a browser, works in any browser, sign into uh, sign into MidJourney, and then from there, do, 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 do. Um, we will. I will take an image of Nick that I already have uh, uploaded on my computer and then use that to start creating images. I'm signed into MidJourney. And let me know in the uh, chat, Nick, if anyone has any uh, special requests. So someone says, I think Nick would make a great Thor. I think we're going to disprove that hypothesis, but let's uh, give her a shot. I would. I guess it means I would have to learn how to pronounce Mjolnir, <laughs> not a string. We also have an Indiana Jones request. That may be a little better because hats. All right. So just what uh, based on what Jordan was saying, the first thing we hear basically we're in like this mid journey chat. Bot. We have this little plus sign here. I can upload a file. So I'm going to choose the image of Nick I have on my computer. There's Nick's headshot. I upload that image. In the most simple kind of variations that sometimes work okay right out of the gate and other times you have to re-roll it and play with it multiple times as uh, Jordan was saying, is that we can take you know this headshot you know, of Nick and we can just try, you know, uh, uh, put in, you know, I, there's the uh, URL for the image that's right above him. And we can just say, you know, that image as store and see, see what it comes up with. And it does take, um, it's not instantaneous. It does take, uh, you know, a, a minute or so before it uh, starts to generate the image. You can do multiple images at a time. What was, so also as Indiana Jones. And while it's doing those, you can, I'll show you a few variations I did just right before this. There, you know, Nick is variations on Pixar characters. Nick is in very attractive AI robot. And Nick as a superhero with a uh, long blonde hair. Uh, so here's Nick as a cowboy. And let's see, does that look like Thor? No, so this kind of goes to Jordan's point as far as... Uh, um, this icon with like the two arrows pointed, pointing at each other, that's basically like the reroll. So it's going to still take, um, it's basically going to take the same image in your same prompt um, and try again. Um, you can kind of add additional criteria to try to make it a little bit better. Or um, as Nick said, we can say, um, let's say Indiana Jones. Yeah, let's say this one in the upper right hand corner um let's say we like that one this u4 or excuse me um it goes in images so here you see u1 2 3 4 so basically the upper left is u1 so let's say with this u2 we can upscale that image to make it a higher resolution um the v underneath it is also to do i kind of like that 
you know, this V2 image. So now I just want to do like variations of that one and see if that gets me closer to kind of what I'm looking for. So here's an upscaled image. From there, once I have an upscaled image, I can also do things like zoom out if I want to see more of the body. Um, so here are, we just did kind of variations of that one image and it's showing me the uh, what those variations uh, of that one image will look like. Sorry, it's jumping around since it's a little, <laughs> since it is a chat bot, it just keeps uh, showing us the um, updated versions. And then uh, these ones are the zoomed out ones. So you can see it, uh, it, it zoomed out a little bit so we can see kind of from the, the waist up and you can even go further on some of the superhero ones, for example, we, you know, zoomed out to get like full body and more of the, uh, more of a city background um, in there as well. So that's the, uh, that's the quick, uh, very quick demo of uh, mid journey and how we generated the images. Um, there's the more advanced techniques that kind of Jordan was uh, discussing as well that uh, involves longer prompts and just taking uh, taking the face or taking out the background to kind of uh, for some of the images that were more tricky uh, or more advanced that we, uh, you know, some of them like this, you can get the image you're looking for in just a few minutes. Other ones... Uh, I, I I think we probably spent way too long. Sometimes I think maybe up to an hour on some just to, but maybe that was our own uh, uh, creativeness getting the best of us. <laughs> yeah, some so, of the things right. that I used in mind, like doing the background scene, you just type in background scene and you put forest or you put in mountaintop or whatever, and it'll it'll take the image and then it'll put the background against the, you know, whatever background scene you choose. Yeah. So back to the slides, Nick. Yep. So uh, Steve alluded to some of those more advanced techniques. Uh, Jordan, I think uh, we've established that the more that Indiana Jones looks like Harrison Ford and the less it looks like me, the better it looks. But let's <laughs> say you did want to have someone's face on someone else's uh, creation. Can you talk a little bit about photo bashing? Yeah, of course. So as you dig into Mid Journey, you're going to realize that Mid Journey, it's, it's still kind of a new technology and it's trying to interpret all sorts of different data, including the imagery that we give it as a reference. Um, and so what happens is a lot of times is it struggles with uh, kind of getting away from the initial reference image, but still keeping the, re the, the authenticity of the face or the the realism and the that we already that we really want in the image. Um, we ran into this problem a lot of times if, if some of the photos that we had people were wearing a blazer, but you ask it to put it in space as an astronaut, and unfortunately it tries to incorporate that blazer into the spacesuit that the character's wearing. And so it becomes a little bit frustrating because you're fighting with mid-journey to get it closer. So photo bashing is a really great way to kind of circumvent that struggle. And and circum and both photo bashing has been around way before AI and mid-journey ever existed in concept arting and stuff like that. Um, but it's a great way to, to get closer. And essentially it's a technique that uses an editing software in multiple photos and, and create one single image. Um, you can use Photoshop is kind of the main one. It's the one that I was using for a lot of the ones that I did, um, but there are other options. Affinity Photo, GIMP, some of those free options, maybe even Canva is a way to do it. Um, but basically what you're doing is a very, very rough cut and paste technique. It does not need to be pretty, um, but you can essentially add props, add characters, specific outfits. So in the case of these three images, there's kind of an order of events here. Um, I had the starting off was a reference image of our headshot that was given to us and they wanted to be a superhero. Um, in the case uh, of this person, he was wearing a clothing outfit that really didn't translate to Mid Journey. Mid Journey didn't quite understand how to interpret that uh, clothing. And so what I did was, okay, let's just pick uh, a superhero pose that seems to work. Um, in this case, it was Shazam. He was making the big, you know, holding the arms, the waist power pose. Um, and so I cut that image out. It was really important to cut out the background. Um, to just a plain white background because Mid Journey will also try to interpret that background. In the case of 
this image Shazam was in a grocery store. So if I just tried using the Shazam photo, it would keep trying to recreate a grocery store, which wasn't exactly what I wanted. I wanted a, a cityscape behind it. Um, and so in this case, I did a really rough and you can see the jagged edges. It does not need to be perfect. You don't need to be a Photoshop expert at this or any kind of cutting out expert, all that type of thing. And then you just take a really rough cut of the person's face and you just drop it right on top of the, the Shazam space, essentially. And then what you do is you use that as your reference image and you kind of do the exact same steps that Steve went through with that image as your reference rather than the original photo that you've used before. And that second image is kind of after a few re-rolls, that's the image that I was able to get that I really liked. Um, I told it to put a, a city background behind him because it seemed like it made more sense contextually. Um, but there are ways even closer to uh, to the person that they look, want them to look like. In this case, it did its best to kind of interpret the face, but it didn't get it quite right. And so there's actually other, uh, I want to say like um, uh, plugins that you can add to Midjourney that will face swap a little bit. And so if you give it a really good starting image, and then in this case, I used a, a swap plugin and it was a save ID, uh, which was the name of the, 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 the prompt. And you essentially give it another reference image and then it face swaps. So in the case of the third image, that's after I face swapped using that external plugin based on the reference image. So it took a few little iterations to kind of get to the final image, but you can kind of see a little difference between the second and third image with a lot closer to the original image. And I think it's a perfect way to keep the fun of the image and, and do whatever you want to. Uh, you can build a world, you can add props, you can add whatever you want to the space, but also kind of keep that realism, keep that uh, you know face matching, if you will, uh, to the original image. And, and like I said, you don't need to be a Photoshop expert. You can download some of these free apps like GIMP and, uh, and Affinity, and you can kind of really be rough about it. Midjourney can kind of interpret what you're going for. It, it, it's okay if you can see some rough edges around the end, but it's a really great way. And you can build full worldscapes with this if you'd like to by adding little elements and, and building it out. So in this case, I've got a few images or another image that I ended up using in this case. Uh, we use that same photo bashing technique. We cut out the face and we put it on top of a cartoon superhero interpret a real face on top of a cartoon and try to still keep that cartoon comic booky character when this the same thing it, it created a i think a more dynamic image than if you were to try to use the same exact prompt with the original reference image on the left there it really had so much more control to what you're trying to make. Uh, and you can even, with this, in the case of the middle image, there's uh, watermarks on the image. Midjourney is pretty good about realizing that and kind of getting rid of those just to use it, because it's just using as a reference. You're not actually using that middle image in any way. Uh, and then yeah, some re-rolls with some tweaks to the prompt, you're gonna get a really, really awesome image uh, using photo bashing. Okay. We have a question in the chat uh, talking about Photoshop. The question is, I believe Photoshop now uses generative AI. Have you used this feature? And if so, how does it compare to Midjourney? Um, I've personally used uh, the generative AI. It is really powerful. Uh, you can essentially cut out objects, type in what you want it to fit then it'll fill in with that. So it's very similar to this process of that photo bashing, but almost within Photoshop. The problem with, with Photoshop's uh, generative AI, and it will get better over time, is that all AI has to use a data set, a base uh, coalition of data that they've essentially pulling from, type, text, all that stuff to create these images. And Photoshop is trying, in order to be able to be kind of a one-stop shop, they're only pulling from their own stock imagery. They're not pulling from any other data sets. They want to build their own data set. Um, so that way, when you jump into Photoshop, you can uh, use their imagery. Because of that, you're limited to what Photoshop has in their own stable. Whereas we can mid-journey, you can pull from a much larger data set. But they're both extremely powerful tools. You can use them in conjunction with each other if you want to build out a mid-journey image bring it into Photoshop and use the generative AI to make those tweaks. They can be a really powerful tool when used together. 
And Steve Kessler is going to talk a little bit about the ethics of AI in a little bit, but uh, another part of the reason that Adobe is going in that direction is that because they have owned images, they don't have any copyright or intellectual property issues with that. And so you know you're not training on images. Um, and that makes it so that, well, Adobe doesn't own images of Thor or of Indiana Jones. Those are characters and IP from uh, other universes, let's say. And so it may be more challenging to get those sorts of things, but you know that the images that you are getting um, are will not have those rights issue attached. OpenAI and their DALI software is also working with Shutterstock. They have a six-year agreement with Shutterstock to be able to use and train off of those images. And so this is a highly evolving ethical area, and I am not a lawyer nor a legal expert, uh, so take whatever I'm saying with not just a grain of salt, but with a salt lick, but this is uh, something to pay attention to. Okay. Lisette, would you like to talk a little bit about the prompting that you're doing? Absolutely. And I will begin by saying that I had never used Midjourney or Discord before, so this was completely new. So anyone who is in the same boat and you never tried it, um, this might be a little bit more for you. So uh, the prompt, the one that you saw everyone, uh, Steve and Jordan enter, it is the slash imagine. And there's really three pieces to the prompt. That first part is the image. If you're going to use an image to begin with, like we did with the AI headshots, that's where you're going to either enter the link or drop that photo in. And the second part of that is the text prompt. So what do you want in your image? Um, what are you trying to, to recreate this as? And with the text prompt, Anything that comes early has more importance than anything that comes later. So if you want a character, you definitely want to put that earlier in there than maybe something with the background toward the end of the prompt. And with the parameters, which is the, the third part of that, it's like it's any weights. And I'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. Um, but it's really any weights that you, you want to stress something more than the other. Like if it's um, a tree house. You know, do you want it to look more like a tree than a house or so I'll talk about that a little bit more in the in this slide, but let me show you if you can go back one, Nick. With these um, and also something I noticed with uh, Mid Journey is that a really common character, so something like Shazam, something like um, Spider-Man, something like anything big known character, it's easier to get that image. Something like Elastigirl, which is from Pixar's The Incredible. So if you have kids, especially kids a couple years ago, um, you probably really, you know, you know this character really well. But characters who are not as well known, it's harder for the AI to really generate the images. So that's why on these, I kind of had to stress uh, Pixar, Elastigirl, or uh, The Incredibles. I went through a couple of of different changes because at first for Elastigirl, it was really something that stretched. So if you if you see that maybe it's not giving you the image, sometimes you just have to be a little bit more specific. But with these prompts here, I kind of just put, um, there's no weights as you can see, all of the words are listed right after each other. And another thing I'll point out is that ambiguous, if you don't really mention if it's a woman or it's a man or anything, it'll give you an ambiguous image. So I didn't put that on there, but that's something you'll notice if you play with it. Um, and now we can go to the next slide and I'll, show you how I found that weights work for me. So a weight with the prompt with that second one, when you're putting in what you want, um, if you put like these two colons after it, if you see after Pixar Elastigirl colon colon two, that tells you how much of an importance you want to that specific word or description. So everything just by default has a weight of one. And if I wanted them to really stress that I wanted this to look like Pixar's Elastigirl and I put it two. You don't have to use really large numbers. You don't have to go like 10 or, or 15 or anything, hundreds. Really right between the, the, the numbers of zero to two is a really good range. So I put again the Pixar, I mentioned the background and the image weight. So that's the weight that you want for the original image that you uploaded in there. Um, that's the ranges between 0 0.5 and two. So two is really the highest. That's how much you want it to stay really as close to that as possible. So I picked, I forgot, it was one here. And I feel like this was the better image of um, our more coworker. I hope she liked it. But really playing with the weights for me 
was was kind of the way I found a better image to the different characters that people requested. And I am not savvy enough to do the photo bashing yet, but Jordan, I, I liked all of your tips. So if you want to start somewhere, I think this is a good way to do it, especially because once you start playing with this and making sure that, you know, your image comes out the way you want, it's easier to start working on creative images that you might use on your work decks or work, um, any work project that you may have, because it'll give you the experience on how to, how to play with different numbers. Uh, one more thing on that, you can also have like a negative weight. So let's say for this image, if I didn't want her wearing the mask, at the end, I can put a negative uh, two maybe for no mask, and then it'll remove that. So just like you can add to it, you can also subtract. Uh, and it also can help with some of the androgyny uh, challenges to try to specify. We had a colleague who wanted to become a Washington Capitals hockey player, and it was very difficult to get her without a beard. Um, and uh, so trying to have a female Washington Capitals football player without the image weight, you really had to take down the Capitals person and bring up her source image. Okay, Danielle. Okay, so we did, we've talked a lot about how we've used um, Mid Journey to, um, to edit and to create new images from the headshots, but there's also other things that I've personally used Midjourney for, and, and it's a good tool when you're thinking out of the box for other things when you're trying to find images that, um, you know, you have your stock images in PowerPoint or you have your images online, but um, Midjourney and AI is also a good resource for that. Um, so we just, I put some samples here um, on the next slide. So for example, this one, um, let's say uh, you want something, you know, you see an image and, and I didn't upload an image. I just put this, the backslash imagine um, and created this image to say in ballerinas. So, so I took the, the first um, image from the stock, from PowerPoint, just stock images. And then I just went into mid journey, did not upload a photo and said, I wanted ballerinas in pink dresses, you know, with a on stage, and it created that same image, but a little bit more flair and more customized to what I was looking for. Um, so there's that you can do. Um, we have this image. So again, this is a stock image of lions running. Um, I just went into mid journey and put in, you know, I wanted an image of lions and I put a background scene of a jungle. And then, you know, just kind of um, played around with the the um, prompts. And then um, this is what was created from that. And then, for example, let's say you're doing something at a call center and you're training a call center and you have your stock images and on um, either online or uh, in, in PowerPoint. You can also create to the left is a stock image to the right is an image that I, that was created using Midjourney. And again, just using props, call center simple props. So really um, the sky's the limit. I mean, you could, any kind of image you want, um, as Lizette said, I mean, I just started personally using Midjourney, um, you know, just to create just for fun. And then it, I just realized all that it could do. So there's there's a lot you can do with it. There's a lot you um, in, in each each time you use it, you find out something new with it, and you can you know how how you can use it and create different images, um, whether for headshots or just for um, in our case, or if you just want some uh, unique images for for other things. Um, we have a question in the chat. Have noticed that a lot of the generated photos in these examples have a graphic novel or illustrated look, is there a way or parameter for the style of the generated imagery? Yeah, I can answer that. There is uh, all, there is a style parameter that you can essentially type in, um, and you could usually just say the style of this. Um, if you're looking for photos to be more photorealistic, you can tell that in the prompt and say photorealistic. You, you can even type in the type of camera you would like the photo to be taken with, the lens that it was taken with. There's a lot of deep in the weeds that you can get into. Um, illustrative, you're gonna find, if you tell it to be illustrative, it will 
Um, you'll have a little bit more leeway as of now. And I think as we continue with AI, it's going to get even better. But right now, I think illustrative, you'll have more leeway with uh, kind of the uncanny valley will be less noticeable when it does go to fully photorealistic. But I think as AI progresses and it rapidly progresses, um, it gets just better and better every time. Um, but you have complete control over that. You just have to kind of put it in the prompt and tell it, I would like this, you know, I want this to be photorealistic. I want this to be in the a painting style, an oil painting. You can type in the specific artist you'd like the style. You know, I, I, we did one, I think that was a Picasso. Someone wanted to be in the style of Picasso. So we, there's so many different ways you can kind of play with it to, to get exactly what you want. Yeah. D different artists was good, uh, different levels of realism. When we were doing superheroes, you can get very different when you were saying movie version versus comic book version, and they look very different. So, um, as Danielle said, it is a lot of fun to, to play around with these new tools. Um, but as our lawyers will tell you, it's all fun and games until someone loses a lawsuit. So Steve, would you like to talk a little bit about privacy and ethics? Oh, who doesn't like to hear about the privacy ethics and law of it all, right? But it's important. And I, in, um, yeah, go ahead to the next one. And in, in this is very much moving quickly and still being figured out. And in the courts, especially with like the law, I think it was just within the last week or two, actually, um, that a judge said that, uh, you know, AI images cannot be copyrighted because they do not have enough human input. Um, so then it kind of becomes a question of like, well, how much human input do you need in order to copyright? So, you know, that's kind of like the current standing is that, but, you know, more more, uh, more court cases may have different determinations in it. And, uh, you know, it, and it does become a question then of like, um, uh, you know, when and if it can be uh, uh, generative images and text could be copyrighted. Um, so the, the law side of it's still very much in flux and will continue to be. On the privacy side, you know, basically we take a lot from what, uh, you know, traditional kind of more data privacy is. And that is you want to make sure, you know, we have informed consent from the person, that we're strongly protecting um, the data um, uh, and encrypting it like in transit in place. Um, and that we're being transparent about what is be what the data is being used for and how we're using it. Now, it's interesting to say that because as Nick already kind of mentioned earlier, OpenAI and also, you know, MidJourney, they, they aren't, you know, as far as like informed consent or transparency or like where they're getting the data from and did they get the people's permission in order to build it into their model? Um, uh, uh, in many cases, some of the leading companies that they aren't necessarily following those rules. And now there's kind of, you know, lawsuits from uh, uh, lawsuits from Arthur authors or people that have generated images uh, that are questioning like the, um, you know, is this, you know, ethical and follow the law that you are basically feeding my content into your AI um, in order to spit things out on the other end. So, um, but but I think it's very important for companies and organizations that are using this understand um, that and then choose different tools. So, for example, um, you know, uh, as we we're talking about with um, Adobe Photoshop earlier, that because they are training their AI model on a different base. Um, it's more likely than that uh, a different base of images that they do have the rights to an ownership for them. Um, that that is, you know, uh, you'll it puts you in a better place. Um, I, I think uh, from an ethical and privacy standpoint, um, since they are using that uh, limited training base on the um, to train the AI. Now on the concept of ethics, uh, there's kind of fairness. Oh, it's the last bullet point on that last slide. Um, ethics, accountability, and human oversight. Um, basically, these AIs, you know, they spit out uh, variations of the data they're trained on. So if you train an AI, um, you know, if ChatGPT was tra trained on a Reddit forum that all thinks the world is flat, um, all the questions you ask the GPT, you know, it's going to keep spitting out that the world's flat. Even though that's wrong, it's going to spit out what it knows. Um, similar to, you know, how uh, if, if you teach a person that, that's they're kind of going to do the same thing. Um, 
from an ethics standpoint, that's why it's also critical, especially so this early in the game, that there's human over, oversight, that you're not fully automating kind of like these AI processes um, in spitting out things. That is already, uh, companies in many uh, in many instances, I've already tried to automate these things and put in chat bots that automatically answer um, questions uh, questions from consumers, and they end up spitting out uh, inappropriate or in or incorrect information. Um, so, uh, uh, lots of companies are saying at this at this point with AI, it's so critical that there is a human uh, in the middle um, in your reviewing what is generated and and being a moderator for it. And then next, yeah. we have a question in the chat. Does the lack of copyright clarity for AI images lack act as a hindrance to using them for nonprofits, where without copyright, the agency or client might not hold full rights to the image? And so, I think the I, I I'm going to use the same disclaimer disclaimer that Nick did earlier. Um, and, and that is, uh, I am by no means an attorney either. I just know from reading it. Um, uh, and, and I would say, yes, if you, if you do need a copyright for an image at this point, if you use generated images, um, it's still in the courts and, you, uh, you know, so it seems, uh, it would, it's a gray area that it's, you, you can try to copyright it, but current case law isn't necessarily in your favor there. Um, hey, now hey, that, be, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, Steve, I, I'd actually seen a case recently as well. They have offered granted copyright to AI generated images. It, it, it's possible. Um, but what I've seen is that uh, you, like you mentioned earlier, you have to, there has to be so you need to use a, maybe Photoshop to AI images together. At that point, you've now you included a human element into that image. And courts are, as of now, from what I've read, are, are continuing to start giving copyright. There's actually a comic book that was made completely out of AI images, and they were given a copyright um, because they took those images and photoshopped them and, and moved them around and built a new thing out of it. But if it was just purely an image on its own from uh, an AI, that is where you're, you're going to run into, as of now, some more issues. It may change as the courts start doing their thing. But Yeah. As I understand it, they, it all hinges on whether there is a human creator. And since we've been def debating what creators are or is since the beginning of humans and, uh, you know, monotheism versus polytheism versus atheism, um, given that debate has gone on and on about what a creator is and who a creator is, uh, we're going to be in this for a while. So, yes, definitely a great area. Um, recommendation for organizations, it's still very much in flux. And I think the best you can do is kind of what the, the conversations we're having right now is like train your, tra train your teams on what basically we just talked about, what the ethics, what's currently known about the ethics, security, and privacy and having an open dialogue, um, you know, with your stakeholders, uh, in teams in order to address their concerns. Um, they, you know, uh, if you kind of leave it unsaid, um, people are going to start playing with this and exploring with it and doing it on their own. So it's better to kind of have the dialogue, um, allow people to um, explore it, but then start to figure out what the guardrails are around what's appropriate or not. Uh, Mid Journey, for example, there's uh, it's important that um, there's there's different plans. Uh, there's a ten dollar plan that all of those images are available to the public. Uh, there's a sixty dollar plan where you can make those images so they're not available to the public. So it's important if you, uh, you know, are going to use tools like that, that you understand those distinctions and start to put those guardrails around your team so that, you know, they aren't accidentally uh, making public things that you uh, don't necessarily want to uh, be public. Um, the regulations are, con are, are constantly, uh, well, not so much regulations, more like case law in the courts right now. It's uh, very much in flux we talked about. Um, 
it, and I think it's just important then to kind of like make sure it's changing so fast that you kind of like regularly, you know, review with your teams and your organization, like, okay, this is our, this is our policy and our stance this is what we know now. And this is where we're going. Um, there is a great uh, resource here at the bottom. That's the um, uh, Nick uh, found. Um, so actually Nick, maybe you might know more about that than I do, but it has a great um, section on kind of the privacy, security, ethics, and even more areas um, that is a, a collaboration amongst uh, nonprofit organizations. You've described it very well, and it's still very much an evolving field. They're looking for folks to opt in. We're reviewing the guidelines as an organization. Many others, I'm sure, are as well. Um, but these are, the, uh, to Steve's point about this idea of continuous review this is something that will ever evolve. Um, many, uh, several of you know of our uh, monthly State of the Union meetings. In our August State of the Union meeting, we talked about how Zoom was allowing for training uh, in its terms and usages policy for AI and machine learning. And so this webinar could have been used for their training data. There was such backlash to that, that they have since backed off from that and taken it out of their terms of services. So in the matter of, two weeks, three weeks, um, they've made a policy change, gotten the backlash and made changed back to where they were before. So ever evolving field. Yeah, and then just the last slide. I, I think this probably much more succinctly and humorously captures what I was trying to say. Um, the, the cartoon that basically like, uh, you know, the conversation between the two people that, you know, what's the, what's the impact of chat GPT or AP I, A, or chat GPT or AI going to be on our business? Uh, we don't know. Um, but we know we're not sure if it's going to take our jobs. It makes up a lot of information. There's security risk to it. It may damage our reputation, but what do we do know for sure that everyone wants to adopt it as fast as we can. Um, and that is actually the uh, is as we're licensing this cartoon. Um, that's actually based on like seventy percent of IT leaders want to use AI and use it more than they're doing now. And uh, coincidentally enough, 70 percent are also have these same fears of like we're concerned about the security, the accuracy, um, in, in the implementation of it. So. It's, it's a very interesting time that uh, we want to move fast and use it, yet we need to be careful. Questions from uh, folks about anything that we've covered or anything that we haven't covered. Um, one of the things you'll note looking at this uh, image is that uh, there are still parts that AI is good at and things that AI perhaps not. As good at, there are people uh, with an extra long thumb or uh, hands are frequently a challenge. And so one person kind of has a head for a hand. Nature of the beast. It's all experimenting here as to what you're going to do, what the prompts are, because this is initially a, a really good image. While we're waiting for those questions to come in, I also want to remind folks that we have a lot of webinars available coming up over the coming weeks and continue to add them. If you go to wearemore.com slash webinars, um, you can see what uh, those webinars coming up, uh, a large number of them, very excited to be able to share things like omni-channel acquisition and how we harmonize our programs uh, across channels. And one's coming up about the future of data, something that we did last year and Things have changed so much that we wanted to revisit the topic and uh, folks wanted uh, kind of an update on that. So all of that is available and more at wearemore.com slash webinars. So Danielle, Lissette, Steve, Jordan, uh, you've gone through this mid-journey experience of doing headshots. Uh, what was your most uh, fun one to do and what was your greatest challenge? And I'll go to Danielle first because I feel like she has it on the tip of her tongue. <laughs> um, well, I got mostly the superhero, um, Wonder Woman. So those were definitely a challenge. Um, I did one, I think the uh, world transformation was fun. Um, I, there was a lot that came up with that and I was able to play around with that. But I think the superhero one for me, the Wonder Woman was the most challenging for sure. 
And I did a couple of those, making sure that they stayed work appropriate was sometimes a challenge on these platforms. <laughs> I think for me, the the one I enjoyed with the most was um, someone came in with their jersey and their basketball kind of uniform, and she she posed, instead of her AI, she sort of posed as shooting. So getting her in the team she wanted and really making it seem like she's actually shot it into the basket was really fun for me, and I think she, she would have really enjoyed it. I didn't get the feedback, but I'm sure she did. Um, I had a few Barbies, and I think Barbie was very difficult. Steve, you mentioned um, kind of you have to be very specific. Is it the Barbie movie or is it, you know, the Barbie cartoon? And it defaulted to that cartoon like nine out of ten times. So it was definitely playing a lot with it. Um, there's also a blend option. Uh, that that was my biggest challenge in this exercise. Steve? Yeah, there there were, there were so many that were so many that were fun, um, and, and then I think on the more challenging side, it was one I, one that you brought up, Nick. There was the two guys that did pose, um, and they wanted to be uh, Venom and Spider Man. Uh, is that right? And, and so you know that was a whole new. We I, I I think we were playing around with that for a while, and we couldn't get. Um, but we ended up separating the two images of them to do them independently, and then rejoining them because getting both of them in the uh, one was hard but also i was like are we trying too hard venom and spider-man both wear masks can't we just send them send send them back a picture of the people with the this with masks on <laughs> uh, thank you and jordan yeah for me i think the superheroes are always fun i'm a giant comic book nerd so it's always fun to build those uh, out um i think the biggest challenge for me and we kind of i kind of spoke earlier was the like when a person wanted their art to look more like picasso the question became is the picasso is it a painting in the style of a picasso painting or would you like to just have a general vibe of picasso do you like you know is the background what what does that mean because a Picasso image, if you've seen it, is very abstract and very, uh, you know, you may not want that to be what you look like. So um, for me, I had to make two versions and go, okay, here's one that is a pure, pure Picasso painting. And then here's one that is just more style. Maybe the outfit is a little bit more of that style or, or whatever, what have you. Um, so it's really kind of getting down into the the nitty gritty of what it is that person may want and what you're looking to make and, and trying to get uh, mid journey to to do exactly what it is that you want it to do instead of just what it thinks it should do. Great, thank you. A uh, question in the chat: Have you tried other tools or AI software, and do you think mid journey is the best? Uh, I think mid journey is the best right now for image creation. Um, there are other ones. Stable Diffusion uh, has a few different ones. There's uh, I think Dolly, if I'm correct, does some images. There's uh, quite a few other ones, but I think for now, Midjourney has the best like realism quality that what you're going to get out of, of that image. Um, there's tons of other AIs out there uh, to use. And I think where you're going to get the most power from AI is when you use AI in conjunction with other AI. When you take an image that you really like in one, and then you use another AI to help build on that world or expand on it. Um, I think there's so much more you can do and you're not limited to one specific software. Uh, and if you're doing willing to do a little bit of work and to kind of create those worlds, you can do a lot more. Great, thank you. And then another question from the chat, can you speak to the current resolution limitations of generated AI graphics? So, Jordan or Steve? Steve, go. Steve, go for it. Sure. Um, so, generating the images themselves is kind of ex in intensely, uh, intensely computationally intensive. So, you'll notice that the uh, it created um, in those images you created, it kind of creates four little ones, and those are actually pretty low resolution. Um, you, uh, they would not. <laughs> Uh, I don't remember the, I don't know if one of you guys remembers the exact uh, resolution, but that's why we can click on that button and upscale it. In that upscale it, um, even the upscaled image then, um, if it was printed out, it would only be, you know, uh, it, it, it the, 
if that resolution would only take up like less than a quarter of a page. Um, so for example, the ones that uh, we printed out at the, uh, we printed out uh, eight by tens on some of those, we like upsample, used AI to upsample uh, the generated images to even try to get them to print out okay on an eight by 10. Um, so th there is very much kind of a, that limitation as well that um, on the current generated images. Yeah. And the default mid journey is 1024 by 1024, I believe, uh, but you can go to twice that on a square image. I also think it, over time, it should get higher in resolution as, as some of these apps start to get better and better. I think mid journey is improved over the many iterations that they have. Um, and then I think there may even be some external other programs and plugins and things that exist to potentially upscale the image a little bit more. Um, and it's using AI to kind of fill out those those pixels and, and try to get it a little cleaner. But um, but yeah, that's like you said, it's using AI with other AI to kind of build that. Yeah. It's AI is all the way down. <laughs>